sitting up here trying to get the mind of God what to preach. And um, I want to be real sensitive to the Lord. Um, <clears throat> I preached out of Psalm 106 this morning. To turn, just turn back over there with me. I'm just trying to figure out what I need to do tonight, what God wants to do. <clears throat> Brother Sasser and I were talking after church about this chapter. He referred to it just now when he was praying. I just felt a little nudge from God maybe to go back and look at that. There are times as a Christian when I don't feel adequate. Anybody else identify with me on that? I don't feel adequate. I feel like I am uh, trying to hold back the tide with a toothpick. I look around and I see where we are as a nation. And I, as aggravated and frustrated as I get with our country, I don't know but what I'm not more frustrated and burdened over the state of our churches in this country. We have missionaries come through here just about every week. I had another one this morning. Brother Jacob Shipman, his wife Shay, wrapping up 18 months of deputation. And um, they came over and eat lunch with us. We always invite when missionaries drop in, we always invite them over to eat with us. And we enjoy fellowshipping with missionaries. I like my kids hanging out with missionaries. As far as I'm concerned, they're God's elite. Amen. Cream of the crop, missionaries. Somebody leave America, go to another country, learn another language, fight with another culture, and all that goes with that, try to start a church. As far as I'm concerned, that's, that's top, top shelf. I feel strongly about that. Amen. And I know many of you do. I won't keep on until everybody in here does. Amen. Yeah. When we have missionaries drop in, they are our honored guest. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he, he, he preached the singles class. I called Brother Nathan at the last minute. I said, I really feel like you ought to give him some time. He said, well, he can take the whole class. I'll teach my lesson next week. So that's what happened. And I heard he did a great job in there. But they sat at the table with us and we heard again what we hear almost on a weekly basis at our dining room table. And that is the report from missionaries of travel about the deplorable state of our churches. And the thing that's sad is it's supposed to be the better of the churches. It's supposed to be. Bible-believing churches, churches where the people are, to some extent, burdened for the lost with soul winning and outreach, buses, missionaries, obviously. They wouldn't have a missionary in it. They weren't missions-hearted, missions-minded to some extent. But to hear him tell, and I hear it everywhere we go. I mean, we hear it all the time. I said, man, y'all's church is awesome. He said, the church is alive. He said, you just won't believe how dead churches are anymore. I said, brother, I would believe it. I've been to some of them. I've been to a bunch of them. And I'm burdened about America. I'm burdened about the direction this country's going in. But, man, I'm burdened about our churches. And there are times when I feel like John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness. And I think, man, Lord, what can, what can I do? I don't ever feel like I'm even coming close to doing enough. I can get done preaching a message like I preached this morning and go home and I still don't feel like I got the burden off of me. I feel like I need to go stand in the street and preach it through a megaphone. It's on me. Brother Johnny, it's on me. And I feel like I'm just one person. I'm just one person. We're just one church, We're one congregation. What can we do? And 
The only answer that I can give you is there's no telling what God can do Amen. with one church that'll sell out to him 100%. Amen. Amen. I mean, holding nothing back, nothing back. The old Moody said, it's yet to be seen what God can do with one man that is fully surrendered. And there are days, I ain't gonna lie to you, there's days I wonder if I even have a clue what that means. What would my life look like, Brother Sasser, if I was 100% surrendered? What would my day look like? What would my, what would my ministry look like? What would my preaching be like, Daniel, if I was 100% surrendered? I mean, that's all day, every day. Not just at times, but that's all the time. And in this chapter, David says in verse number six, we have sinned with our fathers. He didn't just blame it on them. He took responsibility for it. You know, I think the first step sometimes to experiencing true, true revival is we have to assume responsibility Excuse me, I read a book a few months ago. Really, it changed my life. I don't know that I'd recommend it, but it was written by a Navy SEAL called Extreme Ownership. And in the book, he teaches that as a warrior, the only way you can ever be a, the ultimate leader and be an ultimate warrior is you have to take ownership of every decision and every problem, every mistake, and stop shifting the blame. We've gotten really good at getting out from under the burden of the blame. Because if we can do that, then we don't have to do anything to fix it. If we can shrug it off and say, well, it's their fault, or it's that church, or that movement, or that preacher, or that, it happened there, it happened there, then it kind of lightens the load for us. But the truth of the matter is, we won't experience, in my opinion, we won't experience the revival that it's going to take to turn this country around until we shoulder the responsibility for the condition we're in right now. Amen. And there's enough blame to go around, don't get me wrong. There's enough blame to go around. A, a, a passage of scripture that's coming to my mind right now is Nehemiah chapter number one. Just to keep your place right there in Psalm. I have no idea where we're going with this. I'm just trying to mind the Lord up here tonight. I'm going to get back over to Psalm in just a minute. But in Nehemiah chapter number one, they came to Nehemiah and told him that the remnant of, the, uh, of, of that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. Chapter one, verse three. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates are burned with fire. And he said, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed. He began to confess. Verse number six. He said, confess the sins of the children of Israel which have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We can, we can stand up here all night and talk about the, 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 the slow apostasy that has, that has been creeping in for the last 20, 30 years. We can try and pinpoint where it started and, and who dropped the ball and, and, and the decisions that were made. And, and, and we can blame Bible colleges for failing to teach the next crop of preachers how to stand and how to fight. And we can, we can, we can do all of that. But that's not gonna help us. That's not gonna help us if we don't assume the responsibility for the apathy, the coldness that is in our churches now. How can you blame the former generation? How, and, I, and I don't know how many funerals I've preached since I've been here. In six years, Brother Roth, I've buried so many of our senior saints 
that have gone on to be with the Lord, how long can we sit around and point fingers at them and say, well, they didn't pray enough or they didn't win enough souls or they didn't fight or they didn't stand or they didn't make enough noise. They didn't, they didn't resist this, this apostasy wave. They didn't, oh, how, how, long, how long can we do that before we now have to look inwardly at where we are now? And Nehemiah is begging God and praying and he's asking God to forgive us. He says, for both I and my father's house have sinned. There's a song that we used to sing. It's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. This is the thought that's been on my heart for several, several days. I wasn't gonna preach about it. I just, this is how I think. What kind of church would my church be if every member was just like me? How many souls would be saved today if it all depended on what I say? Tell me how many prayers would my Lord have to answer if the only prayers that he heard came from me? I wonder what kind of church would this church be if every member was just like me? Now, I don't know about you, but that's convicting. That's convicting. Getting back over to Psalm. David then begins to list. He didn't just say we've sinned, verse number six, with our fathers, we've committed iniquity, we've done wickedly. He started in verse number seven and he went all the way to verse number 42 or 43 and named as many of them as he could think of. And trust me, he covered a lot of territory. He covered a lot of ground. He talked about them from our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. Talking about the plagues, the 10 plagues. I mean, it's a phenomenal, supernatural moving of God. David said, our fathers lived during those times and failed to recognize it for what it was. And I thought to myself, how many times have I been guilty of God doing something supernatural and I completely miss it? I didn't, I didn't even see it. I, didn't, I, I failed to recognize God's wonder for what it was. Remember not the multi they remembered not the multitude of thy mercies. Underline that. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies. They were guilty of taking for granted something as amazing as the mercies of God dished out by the multitude. But provoked them at the sea. Even at the Red Sea, what was he talking about? Well, they got to the Red Sea and they had rocks on both sides and the Egyptians behind them, the Red Sea in front of them, they said, he brought us out here to kill us. I mean, really? And David's, David's listing this list of sins. He didn't just blanket state, state it. He didn't just kind of throw it out there in generalities, but he get, begins to list it. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. God didn't have to open up that Red Sea. With all that murmuring and doubt and all those accusations and all those things they were hurling at God in his face, he could have just left them there and let the Egyptians wipe them out. But no, he opened the Red Sea and he let them through. He rebuked the Red Sea. It was dried up. He led them through the depths, through the wilderness. Saved them from the hand of them that hated them. Redeem them from the hand of the heaven. And, and he goes on down. They soon forgot his works. Verse number 13. We got a short memory, don't we? I mean, we're only just a few verses into this chapter and David's already twice referenced the fact that they couldn't remember. They forgot. They forgot. You know what that tells me? That tells me that we're entitled. We're entitled. We forget. He goes on down and he talks about them lusting in the wilderness. They was, and he, and, and he 
He talked about the, 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 the uprising against Moses in verse number 16, Korah and Dathan and Abiram, and God opened up the earth and swallowed them up alive into the pit. Talked about the, 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 the golden image that they made. When Moses was up on the mountain, him and Joshua came down and heard the noise as it was a loud noise of war. Get down there and they're all dancing, dancing naked around the, a golden calf. Moses is like, what are you doing? And Aaron's like, well, you know, he threw all his earrings in the fire and here, out, out came his calf. That's what he said. He just threw it in there and it came out. And then, but before Moses showed up, he said, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. And you shake your head and you go, are you serious? And I think, how many times have we done that? It just goes on down. They, look at verse 21. They forgot God, their Savior. Just keep forgetting, keep forgetting. I don't have the time to read all these verses and go over every single situation, but I mean, he just listed these, these atrocious acts of forgetfulness and disrespect to God. And of course, it culminated with the message we preached this morning where they literally begin to pass their children through the fires of Molech, Baal worship. They went from just putting little, little statues on their dresser and you know doing the whatever they did. They're, 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 they're sacrificing their children to Molech. Israelites, how do you get there? How do you get there? How do you go from being delivered how do you get from experiencing the, the multitude of mercies and being brought through the Red Sea and, and, the, and the water out of the rock and the, and the, and the manna and the quail and, and the 40 years without your shoes being uh, wore out and your clothes not being wore out and, and experiencing all that? How do you go from coming across the Jordan River on dry ground and, and watching the walls of Jericho fall? How do you go to passing your children through the fire? How? What I want to know is how we, as the church of the living God, with the inspired and infallible word of God in our hands and the precious Holy Spirit living within us and the answer to prayer and, and, and all that we've got at our disposal, how do we produce a generation that is so cold and dead and desensitized that they can live in sin and it not even bother them. How? And what can we do about it? I guess that's the, that's the thing that eats at me every day. How do, we, how do we fix this? How do we fix this? He said in verse number 41, he gave them into the hand of the heathen. They that hated them ruled over them. That's where we're at right now. We're there in America. We've got people in leadership positions that hate us. Hate this Bible and they hate everything we stand for. Now they're not going to get up and say that because it's going to cost them a few votes. But if they were really honest, if they were really transparent, they would just get over that microphone and they would say, we hate God, we hate Jesus Christ, we hate the church, we hate Christians, we hate the Bible and anything that stands in our way of pushing our globalist, one world, socialist, humanistic agenda. And you've got Christians standing out in, 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 in Idaho in the town square, standing there singing beautiful hymns out of a book, being arrested. While people are throwing Molotov cocktails at the police and breaking out plate glass windows and stomping out the windshields of police cars and, and throwing rocks and bricks at police officers and shooting and killing police officers sitting in their cars. And Christians are being arrested for singing how did we get here? He gave them into the hand of the heathen. And they that hated them 
ruled over them. What I can't get over is how messed up Christians are, so-called Christians and so-called Christian leaders are today in their observations, their, their, their social media posts, their comments. They would absolutely not fit in with the Old Testament prophets nor the New Testament apostles. They would not fit in. How do you call yourself a Bible-believing Christian, a leader, a pastor, someone in a leadership position supposed to be an evangelical Christian and post that many positive comments about Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Yes, sir. How? Preach. Say, preacher, why, oh, why, don't, why, don't, why don't you say something positive about her? i tell you what you do. You show me in your Bible where any of God's men ever said anything positive about Jezebel, and I will. But they didn't. They couldn't. We've got a Supreme Court justice that got seven days of line in state and ceremonial. That was three days longer than JFK got, and he was a president. They treated her like she invented electricity. She was personally responsible for taking the statement in the year of our Lord out of Supreme Court documents. She conducted same-sex marriages and pushed the, 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 the breakdown of the, of, the, of the home and the family and, 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 and was for abortion and everything else that we stand against. And you got people on social media that are pastors and Christian leaders singing their praises. We wonder why we're in the mess we're in. We wonder why the world doesn't take us serious. They can't take us serious because we're not serious. We're a joke. Goes on and says, their enemies also oppressed them. They were brought into subjection under their hand. We're living in those times. We're being oppressed. In the nation of Israel, many times God would put them into captivity. He'd allow the enemy to come in, invade them, and take them into captivity to judge them for their idolatry and to judge them for their failure to remember God. And though we haven't had and a foreign nation break uh, or breach our shores and come in uh, per se and, and, and invade and conquer this land. The globalists and the communists and the socialists and the humanists and the atheists and the God haters have infiltrated every hole and nook and cranny in this nation and we have been now ruled by those and oppressed by those that hate us and God has allowed it. Right, right, amen. God's allowed it. Their enemies also oppressed them and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Look at verse 43. Many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. Jesus, he told the church, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Somewhere along the way, something got disconnected and it wasn't on God's end. It wasn't on God's end. Not this coming week, but week after next, I'll be going down to Greenville, South Carolina for Brother Beckham's prayer conference. He's asked me to preach on prayer and he's asked me to teach and explain Brother Rolfe how to start a prayer ministry because I've been talking to him about what God's been doing in our church and he's just been fascinated by that and wants me to expound on that. But it's amazing to me. It never ceases to amaze me and I've been to every single one of those national prayer conferences, I guess, since they started. I've been a board member. I don't know, I don't know when I became a board member. He never asked me to be. I just one day I realized I was. But I was, I've been amazed from day one at how few people attend the National Prayer Conference. You can have a bus conference, you can have a church growth conference, you can have a soul winning conference, you can have a prophecy conference, you can have a whatever conference you want, but prayer conferences, slim pickings. What happened? Well, brought low for their iniquity, gotten cold and indifferent. 
But after having said all of that, verse number 44 is a blessing to me. Yes, sir. Nevertheless, whew, thank God for the neverthelesses. Thank God for the neverthelesses. He regarded their affliction. Watch this. When he heard their cry. I don't know that I've got all the answers to nationwide revival. I don't know that I have the secret to getting this thing turned around. I do know this, that it's gonna, the Bible says the love of men, will, hearts of men will, will wax worse and worse, grow colder and colder. It's not gonna get better in a general sense, but I believe, I believe, Brother Snipes, with all of my heart, I believe the church of the living God can trim their lamps. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And our lights can shine brighter than they have in the past. Yes, I believe that. And I believe five or six lamps whose lamps have been trimmed can outshine 50 that hadn't been trimmed. Amen. Amen. All it takes is just a few. I imagine Brother Sash could probably get up here and elaborate on that trimming their lamps. He's been over there to Israel and he probably understands that analogy better than I do. But I do know this that every now and then those wicks, they just kind of get, they get all clogged up with soot and junk. They just, they have to be maintained. And that light's flickering because it's got all that gunk on the end of it. And sometimes they have to just go in there and they have to cut that wick and trim it up and clean it up. And when they light it back, boy, it puts out a big fire, a big flame. I wonder, I wonder what would happen, Brother Hall, I wonder what would happen if Calvary Baptist Church trimmed their lamp. I wonder. Look at what it says. He regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. We know he hears. The problem is not on his, on his end. I think the problem is we're not crying. We've gotten used to it, I reckon. We're okay with it. We're okay with them teaching sex education to K-5 students. We're okay with them having transgenders and transvestites reading to the five-year-olds down at the county library. We're, that don't bother us no more. Cross-dressers down there reading and dancing to little kids. I mean, the things that are happening in our world today, used to people would be out in the, in the streets pitching a fit about it. You can't hear anybody, so people don't say a word about it anymore. We just shake our head and say, goodness gracious, and we go on. And it just keeps getting darker and it keeps getting worse and the affliction keeps coming and the, and the oppression keeps coming and them that hate us keep ruling. They heard their cry. I really believe we've got to get to the place to where we're crying. In Exodus chapter number, Exodus chapter number two, verse 23, it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage and God heard their groaning. God Remember this covenant with Abraham. Look at this. With Isaac and with Jacob, last verse of Exodus 2, and God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. Why in God's name would he have respect on a bunch of slaves stomping bricks and mud? Why would he have respect? It was a nasty, deplorable, pitiful, horrible situation you know what God had respect unto them for? They were crying. They were groaning. God looked down and got his attention. Yes. Back in our text, 
I know I'm all over the place. I'm preaching from the overflow this evening. Mm. He regarded their afflictions when he heard their cry. He regarded their afflictions when he heard their cry. As long as we're okay with it, God's not going to do anything. If we're asleep, we're sleeping through it. We're treating church like it's an option. We're treating the Great Commission like it's an option. And, and, we're, and, we're, and we're not voting, and not praying, and not doing anything to, to make a difference. What do you think God's going to do? He's not going to do anything until we get to crying about it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look at verse number 45. After all the times that they forgot him. Look at verse 7. They remembered not. I don't have these underlined in my Bible. Verse 13. They soon forgot his works. I don't have these underlined. I'm just, I'm just skimming it down through here. You get down to verse number 45. He remembered them. He remembered for them his covenant and repented. Here we go again. According to the multitude of his mercies. Verse 7 and verse 45 is absolutely amazing. They forgot his multitude of mercies. But because of his multitude of mercies, he remembered them. Are y'all getting this tonight? I'm glad God don't do us like we do him. Amen. Amen. I'm glad God don't forget us when we forget him. Amen. And he repented, verse number 45. I'm glad he repents even when we don't. Come on now. Yes, sir. That's the same word, by the way, you find over there in Jonah, chapter number three. Yeah, I believe the Holy Ghost just brought that to my attention. Jonah three, what about that? They were fasting, they proclaimed to fast. People of Nineveh, just as chapter 3, verse 5, people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed to fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. They cried mightily, verse number 8, unto God. Is that what your Bible says? That everyone turn it from his evil ways. They said, who can tell if God will turn and repent? Turn away from his fierce anger and we perish not. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil ways and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them and did it not. What a blessing. I don't know about y'all, but I'm seeing, a, I'm seeing a theme here. Something about crying unto God and getting right turns the heart of God. Turns the captivity just wonder tonight if we're sick of it enough to cry. I wonder if it's bad enough yet. You see all these silly memes about 2020. Man, what a year. It's been for the, one for the record books, hasn't it? And we got Christians that still ain't been to church in six months. What's it gonna take? What's it going to take for us to get real, get serious? We got people that got completely out of church. How do you get out of church during a national pandemic? How do you get out of church? How do you, how do you, how do you not run to God? I don't understand it. He remembered them for his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives. God did that. 
the ones that carried them captive, God made them have pity on them. That's what happened with Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2, what's wrong with you? What's the matter with you, Nehemiah? Your face is all changed. I can tell something's bothering you. He said, man, the gates and walls are burning with fire. Yes. Send me that I may build them. He said, all right, go ahead. Get you a bunch of people here. Let me give you a love offer and go fix that. How crazy is that? How crazy, how crazy is it for Nebuchadnezzar to go steal all those young men and bring them in captive into Babylon and then tell everybody, okay, we're going to worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Huh? Is that not what the Bible says? Sure it is. He made them to be pitied of all those that carried them. Look at the prayer in verse number 47. Save us, O Lord our God and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. What a prayer. Save us, Lord, from the heathens. He can. He can. Here's the problem. We're mingled with the heathen. Huh? That's what happened. In verse number 35, how are you going to get saved from the heathen when you're mingling with them? Right. 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 I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but somewhere in this chapter, they got up to here with the heathen. They was ready to bail. God said, when you get sick and tired of the heathen, when you get sick of the oppression, when you get sick of being ruled by those that hate you, and you cry out to me, I can turn this thing around. God said, I'm just up here waiting on you. So preacher, what are you saying? Well, I started this message out with there's days when I feel so inadequate. What can I do? That's what we can do. We can cry out. Yeah. We can come out. We can come out from among them, be separate. We can cry out. We can confess and get right with God for our sins and the sins of our fathers. Beg God for mercy to save us from the, among the heathen so we can give thanks unto his holy name, to triumph in his praise. Verse 48, blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say amen. 